Chapter 48 Are you sure this is a good idea? Evelyn asked anxiously. Alice glanced up from where she was checking her equipment. No, I'm not, but it's an idea, and it's the only one we've got. I just hope you're as good as you say you are with that sling of yours. I never said I'm all that good. Other people might have said it, not me, Evelyn protested. Alice regarded her cynically. Maybe, but I never heard you contradict them. The discussion was interrupted by a light tap on the doorframe of the room they shared. Come in, Alice called, and the screen door slid open to admit Lord Nimatsu. The Nihonjan nobleman wore a worried look on his face. He glanced at the bed and saw Alice's equipment laid out already. Arisan, he said, bowing to her. I see you are determined to go ahead with this. I'm afraid I have to, Lord Nimatsu. Your people won't go through that forest unless we show them that we have killed the terror. And this is the best way I can think of to do that. But couldn't you try with another pig, or a goat perhaps, as bait? Nimatsu asked. Alice shook her head. The terror has shown it's not interested in animals. It only killed the pig to silence it, so that we'd get no warning that it was there. But once that was done, it didn't touch the carcass. It sat under our tree for hours, waiting to see if we'd come down. It wants people. It's a man-eater. So this time, I'm the pig. She waited a second and glanced at Evelyn. You could always object to the way I phrased that, she suggested. Evelyn made a disclaiming gesture. This is too serious to joke about, Alice. You're putting yourself in terrible danger, and you're putting a lot of trust in my skill with the sling. Why don't we draw lots to see who's the bait? Nimatsu's gaze switched quickly between the two girls during this exchange. He nodded several times. You are risking a great deal, Arisan. Is Evanin san as skilled as you say? She's a lot better than I am with the javelin, Alice told him. So it's logical that I'm the bait and she's the hunter. A friend of ours says she can knock out a gnat's eye with a shot from her sling. I'm not sure I'm that good, Evanlin said doubtfully. Alice raised an eyebrow. Well, this isn't the best time to tell me that. Evelyn let the comment pass. She knew Alice's sarcasm stemmed from her nerves. The tall girl was putting herself into a position of appalling danger. She might try to pass it off lightly, but it was only natural that she should be fearful of what was to come. In any event, Alice continued, once it all starts, I'll be safely tucked up under my shield. You'll be the one out in the open, having to deal with the big kitty cat. She indicated the big wooden shield that had been made to her instructions. Almost two metres high, it was rectangular in shape and formed into a shallow curve. It was, in fact, identical to those being used by the Kikori, and she planned to use it to protect herself from the Kyofu's attack. Namatsu sighed deeply. He admired this tall, courteous girl, and he feared that she wouldn't survive the coming night. "'I still say I don't like this idea,' he said, with a note of finality in his voice. He sensed he would not dissuade her. Alice grinned at him, but there was little real humour in the grin. "'I'm not mad about it either, but currently it's the only idea going round.' Somewhere close to hand, an owl hooted at regular intervals. When she had first heard the sound, Alice's hair had stood on end. Now she had become accustomed to it, and it had become part of the overall tableau of the night, along with the occasional rustle of small, nocturnal animals moving under the trees and the soft breath of the wind through the branches. She stood with her back to the largest tree she could find, the heavy shield planted in front of her, her arm through the support strap, ready to lift it into position. Only her head 
showed above the rim of the shield. In a scabbard on her right hip, she wore Evelyn's sax knife. The shorter weapon would be more useful and easier to wield than her long sabre, assuming everything went to plan. Her two javelins were rammed point down into the ground beside her. She doubted they'd be any use, but she brought them anyway. Her head, face and right arm were wound with tough leather for protection against the terror's claws. By now she was convinced that it was some form of giant predatory cat. She had heard tales of tigers and their almost supernatural ability to take prey silently and unobserved. She couldn't imagine a bulky, clumsy animal like a bear doing that. She leaned back against the tree. Her legs were aching. She'd been standing there for several hours, and the unrelenting cold was creeping up her legs, stiffening the muscles. She longed to sit down for a few minutes, but knew that would place her at a disadvantage if the monster appeared. Standing, she could move instantly, bringing the shield up to face an attack from the front or either side. The tree protected her rear. She moved her legs, trying to get the blood flowing, easing her weight from one to the other. The momentary ease only made the discomfort worse when she placed her weight on the tired muscles once more. She wondered what time it was. The narrow moon had long departed and the shadows under the trees were deep and inky black. She looked up to the platform they'd built in the tree opposite her position. She could just make it out and see the dark bulk of Evelyn's form as she kept watch. At least Evelyn could sit down, she thought. And that was... Something was wrong. She sensed it. Something in the forest had changed. Her heart pounded as she tried to pinpoint the difference. Then she had it. The owl hadn't hooted. Without realising it, she had been counting in her mind after each hoot. The owl had been making its mournful sound regularly, after she had counted between 150 and 160. Yet her automatic, almost subconscious count had just passed 173. There was something here, something close by. Above the rim of the shield, her eyes darted from one side to another, searching the shadows, trying desperately to gain her first sight of the predator, striving to discover where the attack would come from. Alice! Left! Left! Evelyn's warning cry shrilled through the forest, and Alice swung to her left, lifting the shield as she saw a vague blur of movement coming at her. Something huge slammed against the shield and sent her flying several metres. She gripped the handles desperately to retain her hold on the shield, her only hope of safety. She crashed onto her back on the ground, skidding in the powdery snow, the breath driven from her body in one explosive grunt. Then something huge and heavy and incredibly strong was on top of her with only the curved wooden shield between them as she cowered under it, drawing herself up to protect her head and body and feet, clinging desperately to the handles as the monster tried to tear it away to get to its prey. Now she could hear the blood-chilling snarl of the Kyofu as it tore at the wood with its claws and bit the top rim of the shield with its massive teeth. As huge cats do, it had drawn up its hind legs to disembowel its prey with one savage downstroke. But the raking claws met not flesh, but hard wood, reinforced with iron. They splintered the first and gouged deep grooves in the second. The beast snarled in frustration and fury as long splinters of hardwood stabbed into the pads of its paws. Somewhere beneath this unyielding surface, it knew, was warm flesh and blood, and it redoubled its efforts to get to it. Evelyn saw the sudden blur of movement from the edge of the clearing as the Kiofu 
launched its attack. She just had time to shout her warning before the monster slammed into the shield, sending Alice flying. So far, Alice's plan was working. She'd managed to keep the big shield interposed between the predator and herself. Now it was Evelyn's turn. She kicked the coiled rope over the side of the platform, slid down a few metres, then dropped the remaining distance to the forest floor. Her sling was already in her hand, and as she regained her feet, she was feeding one of the heavy, egg-shaped lead shot into the central pouch. She wanted maximum velocity. So she spun the sling twice, then released, whipping the brutal projectile across the clearing at the predator. The scene seemed to unfold slowly in her vision. She could see now that the Kyofu was a huge cat, much larger than the sand lions Selethan had pointed out to her when they were travelling through Arida. This was immense, and its coat was white, marked with blurred grey stripes. A snow tiger, she thought. Then her shot hit the animal with a sickening crack, taking it on the left shoulder, smashing and splintering the bone beneath the fur. She moved automatically, reloading the pouch, whirling the sling, releasing again. Smash! The second shot slammed into the creature's ribs, fracturing them. The tiger howled in agony and fury and swung its head to see where its attacker lay. Beneath the shield, Alice heard the violent, thudding impacts as the two shots hit the beast in quick succession. At the first, she felt a lessening of the pressure on her right side as the creature's left foreleg was smashed at the shoulder, leaving it limp and useless. Then she heard another cracking thud, and the Kyofu was no longer intent on tearing the shield loose. As it raised its head to search out Evanlin, the weight on Alice was suddenly lessened and she could move her right arm. She released her right hand grip on the shield and, with the strength of desperation, clawed the sacks from its scabbard. Evanlin placed her third shot carefully sending it crashing into the animal's rear left hip. Again, bone crunched, and the tiger's left rear leg suddenly went limp, so that its intended leap towards the figure it could now see beneath a tree across the clearing came to nothing. It flopped awkwardly, without thrust on one side. The agony in its rear leg flared, and, mad with pain, it snapped at the injury with its massive fangs. As it twisted to do this, Evelyn's fourth lead shot hit its head with shocking force. And at the same instant, Alice reached round the edge of the shield and drove the razor-sharp sacks deep into the creature's underbelly, cutting upwards to create a wound almost half a metre long. The monster roared, a shrill note of baffled terror overriding the heart-chilling savagery of its normal challenge. Crippled, gutted and dying, it collapsed sideways on the snow, now running red with its blood. Desperately scrabbling with her feet, Alice forced her way backwards from under the shield, sliding on her back to escape the reach of the horrible creature. Evelyn ran to her, grabbed her arm and dragged her clear, bringing her to her feet. The two girls clung to each other. Then the Kiofu gave one last, shuddering screech and lay still. It's dead, Evelyn said numbly. Alice said nothing. Overcome by shock at her ordeal, reacting to the terror of those minutes crouched under the shield, she felt her stomach heave and was violently sick.